Ah, oh, yes. Egypt. A culture so rich in history that everyone on this earth knows who our cat-worshipping friends of the Nile are. For their extraordinary resilience to the test of time, for their magnificent architecture and ingenuity, rich mythology, and being complete doormats. You see, Egypt lasted so long not because it was really ahead of everyone in battle tactics or advanced military technology, it was more because it didn't really have competitors. You see, back in the Bronze Age, the only competing powers for Mediterranean supremacy were the Mycenaeans, Hittites, or Eastern Mesopotamians. And to be honest, they weren't really that big of a threat back then. By the end of the Dark Age, of the Bronze Age collapse, meaning 900 BC, the competition became much bigger, with newly emerging powers like the Greeks, Phoenicians, and Assyrians. And if all long-lasting empires has taught us anything, is that they become outdated with the times and are either dismantled, crumble from the inside, or just simply disappear from relevance. But even though we like to talk about Egypt, we seem to forget it had neighbours, and quite relevant neighbours at that, like the Nubians. Hi, I'm Claude, and today on Untold History, we will be exploring the history of Nubia, Egypt's neighbour, who stayed an autonomous culture and civilization, and who repelled enemies even when against impossible odds. Our story begins in the late Stone Age, which translates to estimately 4000 BC. To the north of modern Sudan and southern Egypt, the Nubians were yet another hunter-gatherer-like people. For most of this period, they would stay around the Aswan and Khartoum river of the Nile, and live peaceful lives as farmers and fishermen along the Nile, with no real central government or kingdom controlling the region. It would only be until 2300 BC when they would be acknowledged by their sun-loving neighbours, being called by Egyptian scholars as Taseti, or Land of the Bow, or Kojites. Indeed, Nubian cultures by the middle of the Bronze Age had grown significantly with slight Egyptian influence, being known coincidentally for their archery, being exceptional archers, and having established a talent for pottery. Egyptians and Kushites would keep amicable ties together, trading with each other, sharing pagan gods, and even having arranged marriages to strengthen their bond. But it wouldn't all be so nice and mushy, because... Ew! Peacetime! Get it out of here! Children might see! Of course, both cultures would clash, the most notable being when Egypt would expand their territory along the Nile, invading Kushite territory and integrating their culture into their own. Most notably by erecting an absolutely insane amount of pyramids everywhere, and at the 25th Egyptian dynasty in 746 BC, where the kingdom of Napata, under the leader Pierre, would conquer Egypt and rule for around a century until they were kicked out. There would be a lot of back and forth between the two, but most of the time both kingdoms would stay somewhat allies. It would only be in 1070 BC when the first kingdom of Nubia would be installed, being the kingdom of Kush. This is when Kushites truly became important in the geopolitics of the post-Bronze Age collapsed Mediterranean, being relatively unscathed by the sea people and all the bad shit insanity that was going down up north. The Kingdom of Kush became a serious centre of trade between the Mediterranean and Central Africa, becoming a somewhat trading culture just like the Carthaginians, exchanging treasures like gold and goods from Central Africa, or even Middle Eastern and Egyptian goods into Central Africans. In simple terms, they were in a pretty good place all around. Now you see, something I haven't mentioned yet is that the Kingdom of Kush worked as numerous city-states, such as Meroi, Kerma, and Napata, being the main cities to hold the name of capital city. Most of what went on happened there, because the rest of the Kushite territory was mainly rural and less advanced. So, if something happens, or someone, you know, takes those cities, you pretty much take over the kingdom. Which is exactly what happened later on the Iron Age. As you know, the Assyrians went on a huge conquering frenzy, and the Kushites were somewhat spared, only being permanently kicked out of Egypt for good, but they didn't really last to make an impression to our trading people. That wasn't the case for our next big conquering bully, the Achaemenid Empire, who took over in the 6th century BC with superior military technology, tactics, armor, and just kidding, they also got trashed, only taking one fortress 
and in the words of Herodotus, a famous Greek historian who covered Persian expansion, lol, those fools got wrecked. This sort of behavior of the Kushites wiping the floor with invading forces happened a few more times, happening once more with the Ptolemaic Egyptians in the 4th to 3rd century BC and the Rashtun Caliphate in the far future of the 6th century AD. The Kingdom of Kush would keep autonomy from whatever empire had taken over Egypt most of the time, keeping a strong sense of culture and resisting most attempts of assimilations from the Assyrians, Mesopotamians, Achaemenid Persians, and Ptolemaic Greeks, thus keeping its economy and kingdom rich from trading. This would be what is now called the Meroitic Period, which was a period from 300 BC to 400 AD where Meroe was the center of trade of the Kingdom of Kush, and would see a somewhat golden age until it disintegrated at its fall. This is important because it became a powerhouse of the ancient market. This doesn't mean it was invincible though, for in the 1st century BC, a new power came. A new power that was different, that was far more powerful than any other superpower that came before it, and would reshape Nubian history forever. Okay, though, it really wasn't that big, though. It was only... Rome, our boy in red. While the Kushites were going on with their trade and setting up coups and dirty rumors in the Ptolemaic ranks, Rome has been lifting weights, conquering kingdom after kingdom, empire after empire. A true force to be reckoned with. But was also in political unrest and stability and was going through a civil war when the Kushites interacted with the Romans for the first time. More specifically, it was by this point Caesar had conquered Alexandria in 47 BC and went on a love boat with his 31 years younger mistress Cleopatra VII. When Egypt was in fully in Roman control, both empires and kingdoms would map out the new borders of the map, which stayed reasonable to the Romans, but less favorable to the Kushites. This would result in a five-year conflict led by Queen Aminarenas, which resulted in a partial Kushite victory, having restored their sovereignty from Roman expansion, but only stayed a client state and was brutally put back in its place after legionnaires sacked Napata and killed thousands, ending with forcing a treaty on the surviving Kushite kingdom. Okay, so in this treaty, you can only trade with me, you will become a client state, you must pay tribute annually, and we accept slaves as gifts. Well, that's all fine, but what's in it for us? You exist. For the rest of the Roman Empire, the Kingdom of Kush would stay independent from the Latins, even though becoming somewhat of a client state, but still keeping true to its culture. By the end of the Roman Empire, or at the brink of its collapse in 350 AD, the Kingdom of Kush would cease to exist. After the capital of Meroi was sacked and the kingdom toppled by the Aksumites, who took over the Red Sea and dissolved them to dominate this trade system. By this point, the Kingdom of Kush would become three successor states, Nobatia, Mancuria, and Elodia, and the Romans, seeing this, found the perfect opportunity to spread influence, specifically religious influence. Having recently become fully Christian by Constantine I, the Roman Empire attempted to Christianize their neighbors down south. But that wasn't necessary in this case, because these three kingdoms would convert to Christianity at their founding, having been the only real surviving powers of the Aksumite sacking that still had prominence in the kingdom. Something that is interesting to note is that Nubia is actually a very rare case of an African kingdom who fully converted to Christianity with nothing but soft power, having been a fully internal change. Like, yeah, the late Romans slash Byzantines technically are responsible for the change, but like the Greeks under Ottomans, they could have just existed and continued on with their own religion if they really wanted to. Anyway, back to the main plot. Not much would really change for our three little kingdoms for quite a while, even though a lot was going down outside. The Roman Empire has officially fallen. The Kingdom of Aksum would commit genocide on the now Jewish Himorites of the other side of the Red Sea, and later Romans would keep good ties with the Nubian kingdoms and thus would flourish with staying somewhat neutral through the whole ordeal and continue trading with other cultures. Things wouldn't stay normal for long though, for a new enemy arose from the depths of the Arabian desert. A fierce, big and powerful army would rise to claim the mantle of God and strike fear in the hearts of their enemies. This was the 7th century AD, 
more specifically 622 AD, when Arab forces under Muhammad himself would unite huge territories in what is now Saudi Arabia and continue into Byzantine and Sassanid territory. For the next decade, the Great Islamic Conquest would be one of the biggest expansions in such a short period of time in human history. This affects our story only when they take over Egypt in 641 AD. Because at this point, the Arabs wanted some of that sweet, sweet trade. But they weren't going to do some treaty or some other cowardly thing. They wanted it for themselves. So in 642 AD, the Caliphate would march a huge cavalry-based army of 20,000 men to invade the Three Kingdoms. Specifically, the city of Dongola. Our Nubian friends had to think fast and raise an army of 10,000 men to counter the Caliphate, where the first battle of Dongola would begin. Now, remember that little detail I mentioned earlier? The fact that the Nubians were exceptional archers? That little detail would prove to be very useful in the Nubian army against the Caliphate. Because you see, the Arab army consisted heavily on light cavalry which has proven to be very effective against earlier enemies like the Byzantines and Sassanids. But our Arab foes were not aware that light cavalry is, well, not very effective against an absolutely ungodly amount of archers. And sadly, the Nubians were experts in such fields. The Battle of Dongola was a devastating defeat for the Arabs, and a stunning victory for the Kingdom of Mancuria, the Northern Kingdom of Nubia. The Nubian archers would wipe the floor with the Caliphate's horsemen, resulting in the worst scenario that the rations could face. A peace treaty. Such a treaty would be violated in 652 AD, but nothing of note happened, really. No wait, actually, the Second Battle of Dongola had a Roman catapult on the Arab side. That's actually pretty cool, as if it really did anything except destroy a cathedral. Anyway, this battle will be one of the biggest defeats against the Caliphate, and a huge embarrassment for the Arab army, stopping any future plans for the conquest of the Nile for being too much of a hassle. But also one of the greatest victories for the Nubian kingdoms, showing the Mediterranean what they're really made of, and overall like a huge ego boost. The Caliphate would eventually sign the Bact Treaty, which would allow peaceful trading between both civilizations, making them an even bigger trading ally for the Mediterranean and African traders, becoming insanely rich and prosperous for centuries to come. Sadly, he had to begin sometime. The end of Nubian civilization was near. By the end of the Crusades of the middle of 1204 AD, and the rise of the Mamluks would result in a successful invasion of North Nubia, in 1272 AD, with the excuse of not having the annual trading quota of the Bact Treaty fulfilled, and Mancuria, the Nubian Kingdom of the North, Arabized into Mamluk influence. The end of the last kingdoms of Nubia were long, drawn out, and anticlimactic, with the Nubian identity and culture over time becoming a thing of the past and nothing but a fading memory, as cathedrals were converted into mosques and Christian values of Elodia and Nobatia would be replaced with Islamic values that fitted the Mamluk's desires of the Nile. By 1004 AD, the Nubian kingdoms and its existence before them would cease to exist, having become fully Arabized and vassals as the language, culture, and way of life would be fully assimilated. Northern Nubia by this time would be under total Egyptian control, and the south conquered by the new kingdom of Sinar down south. By the 19th century, though, Nubia in its totality would be controlled by Egypt by Muhammad Ali, and later on by British colonialists. Nubia is quite an odd civilization. It has stood for quite some time, stayed as one of the oldest allies and enemies of Egypt, an ally of the Christian faith given access to the Mediterranean world to Africa, a part of the world that was simply alien to them, and stood against one of the biggest expansions of the world. Yet we forget that Sudan, that is in the south of modern Egypt, even exists. We mustn't forget such a beautiful culture, because it still is quite the mystery today, and has achieved some things that are simply extraordinary to even our modern standards. Did you know Sudan holds more pyramids than Egypt? Did you know that Nubian culture at its time was fully egalitarian, giving rights to men and women equally? Did you know Nubia is the reason Egypt even got all its gold? 
And did you know that Nubia is the one of the only kingdoms who stood against the Caliphate? These are just some facts that the civilization holds, and if we look deep enough, we can find even more fascinating things about it that could make it worthy of being talked about in our education overall. Something to be remembered while watching this is that this is not an in-depth look on Nubia. This is more like a brochure, or an overview of its history, and that if you enjoy, you'll look more into and research for yourself all the rich information we have on it. And I feel like it's important to have these little brochures on YouTube, because that will get people interested in parts of the world that are criminally underrated in our media, and that need to be known by the average person. Because Nubia is just a fraction of the cultures of Africa that are worth talking about. Sudan in this time, even though has lost most of its old culture, still holds some of it tightly, and most of what we know are only from archaeological findings, and we need more people to be passionate enough to help out on find the forgotten history of Nubia for the sake of the inhabitants of Sudan and Egypt, so that we can all remember the true beauty of its past. So, if you enjoyed, and want to see more of these types of videos, I recommend you like and subscribe, for this has been The Untold History of Nubia.